Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Ferdinand Handelopper. I'm the president of the University of Waterloo. And on behalf of the university, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the 41st uh, annual Hagee Lecture. I also like to take this opportunity to recognize John Milkey, Heggy Committee Chair, and also George Freeman, President of our Faculty Association, who's co-sponsoring this evening's uh, lecture. And also I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our Faculty Association for, for being a long-term, long-time partner for hosting many wonderful Heggy Lectures at this theater and elsewhere. At this time, I would like to welcome this year's Hagee lecture, lecturer, Professor Ian Hacking. Tonight, we continue our series of Hagee lectures in memory of University of Waterloo's founding president, Dr. Joseph Gerald Hagee. This lecture is offered annually under joint sponsor, sponsorship of the university and the University of Waterloo Faculty Association. The spirit of the uh, annual lecture is the same spirit that drives this university. It is about the link between theory and practice, which is embodied, embodied in everything from Waterloo's cooperative education program to the translation of research into knowledge. Since our founding in 1957, we have sought to create an environment that combines the best in science, technology, and the humanities in a way that stays relevant to the lives of Canadians in a rapidly changing world. That was Jerry Hagee's vision and his legacy. It's about ideas, the love of ideas, and the power behind them. And so, I would like to hand things over to John Mielke, chair of the Hagee uh, Committee Chair, who will provide a few words of of introduction for tonight's lecturer. And again, everybody, thanks for being with us tonight and enjoy the lecture. Well, good evening, everyone. And please allow me to begin by echoing President Hamdalopper's remarks. Welcome to this evening's lecture. Before we introduce our guest, I would like to take a moment or two just to introduce the lecture series itself carrying on again and echoing some of the President's earlier comments. The series was created in 1970 to honor the contributions of Dr. Gerald Hagee, who helped to establish the University of Waterloo in 1957 and served as its first president between 1957 and 1969. At that time, the stated goal of the lectures, which have remained jointly sponsored by the Faculty Association and the University, was to bring to our campus individuals who had made substantial contributions to a scholarly or creative endeavor. As well, the hope was that each year's speaker would present not only engaging ideas, but ideas that would help to show how our community could bring together different fields of inquiry. Now, the first lecture was delivered in January of 1971, and each of the speakers has more than accomplished the initial goals set out. And in so doing, they've made an important contribution to public discussion, both within our local and broader communities. Now, among others, we've been very fortunate to welcome Nobel laureates, such as Gerhard Hertzberg and John Polanyi, public intellectuals, such as John Ralston Saul and Michael Ignatieff, and influential artists, such as Adam Agoyan and Margaret Atwood. To this wonderful list, we are very pleased to add our 40th invited guest, Professor Ian Hacking, who will be introduced by my colleague from Statistics and Actuarial Sciences, Professor Wayne Oldford. Uh, <clears throat> it's my pleasure and honor tonight uh, to introduce the University of Waterloo's 2011 Hagee lecturer, Dr. Ian Hacking. University Professor of Philosophy, Philosophy of Science at the University of Toronto and of Philosophy and History of Scientific Concepts at the Collège de France in Paris. Born in Vancouver and educated at the Universities of British Columbia, 
in Cambridge. Dr. Hacking is widely recognized as a preeminent philosopher and historian of the sciences. In his own words, his life, intellectual and otherwise, can be summarized by three words. Quote, I am curious, unquote. Dr. Hacking may choose to expand on that later, I don't know. But this curiosity is more than borne out by an enormously broad and deep body of work, work that is important, historically grounded, interdisciplinary, investigative, and original. Dr. Hacking's influential books have addressed important topics as diverse as statistical inference, scientific revolutions, and multiple personality disorder. They have won awards and many are now considered classics across the social, natural, medical, and statistical sciences. Dr. Hacking and his intellectual work has been recognized by nationally and internationally by numerous awards and prizes. And to name but a few, he is a companion of the Order of Canada, Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and of the British Academy. His, per his elected permanent chair at the Collège de France is the greatest honor the French bestow on an academic. And in 2009, Dr. Hacking was awarded the Holberg Prize, established in 2003 by the government of Norway, and now considered by many to be the Nobel Prize for the Humanities. The citation reads that this was for, quote, his combination of rigorous philosophical and historical analysis, which has profoundly altered our understanding of the ways in which key concepts emerged through scientific practices and in specific social and institutional contexts. His work lays bare the normative and social implications of the natural and the social sciences. Dr. Hacking, in reference to Michel Foucault, has described the role of a public intellectual as that of, quote, trying to discover the elements of the things which our society takes as inevitable and which aren't inevitable in order to give us a better grasp of who we are as social beings. Dr. Hacking's numerous intellectual works, his writings in the literary press, and his public addresses clearly establish him as a, among Canada's and the world's most eminent public intellectuals. It gives me great pleasure to now invite Dr. Ian Hacking to deliver the 2011 Hagee Lecture entitled, How Did Mathematics Become Possible? Thank you very much for these kind words. A little embarrassing. Uh, Professor Oldford uh, left out the I am curious ending. It was actually a quotation which I gave in front of the Princess Royal of Denmark, in which I referred to an old time very low-level pornographic movie called I Am Curious, Yellow, <laughs> and I Am Curious, Blue. I am glad to say that Her Royal Highness applauded. But unfortunately, in Canada, we can't say things like that. And also, I may say that I, this, uh, what I said there was printed in the newsletter of the Collège de France in Paris, which, and I was told that it would displease the French president for its premium institution to refer to pornographic materials. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is a rather unusual, for me, return visit, perhaps, for anyone. In 45 years ago, I was in my first year as an assistant professor of philosophy at UBC. I had published my first book, Logic of Statistical Inference and fathered my third child. Dave Sprott of the Statistics Department invited me to come east and give a talk. It was at the end of the first decade of the University of Waterloo, when President Hagee was in charge, and in which the institution, partly thanks to him, was in rapid expansion. Lots of resources, most of them 
invested in a visionary way, including vigorous recruitment. I met many fine people. I may mention Professor Gunambi, who is here tonight in the statistics, formerly, uh, I mean, retired from the statistics department, and was given every attention. On the second day of my visit, I was made an offer no sane person could refuse. Remember, I was a starting prof, lousy salary, with three small children and a hardworking housewife. I was offered, as I recall, double my salary and a research professorship in any departments that I wanted. Well, I had my own weird set of values, and I said, no. I may mention one consideration. I had left Vancouver in early March, a full spring of flowers, <laughs> a dawn chorus of happy birds. I flew in, and I caught the train from Toronto to Kitchener, where Professor Sprott met me, holding up a copy of my book, in fact. The Via Rail I took today advertises uh, wonderful picture windows. Well, I had never seen a more bleak countryside <laughs> in my entire life. Patches of gray snow beneath gray sny. The only adornment seemed to be the odd rusting pickup abandoned in the field. <laughs> Incidentally, what I saw today, all those trees which I saw weren't there 45 years ago because of poverty in Canadian farming. Live here, I said to myself, instead of lotus land? Well, enough personal recollections. The labors of President Hagee and many colleagues created one of the great scientific and technical universities of the world. This talk goes back to the beginnings. How did mathematics, this human practice, skill, and procedure become possible at all? Without mathematics, no University of Waterloo, or anything much else in our techno-scientific world, for that matter. The Perimeter Institute has just opened its Stephen Hawking Center nearby, so I'm going to begin with a few of his casual worlds. By the way, how do I actually work the... Uh, well, I'll figure out when it comes. There it is. Okay, that's the one to press. Good. I should have put, I should have put this, this quotation up on the screen, but as you will see, I'm not really a PowerPoint person. That's a pretty good PowerPoint, though, isn't it? Okay, Hawking said a few years ago, the evolution from earthworm brains to human brains, presumably took place by Darwinian natural selection. The quality selected for was the ability to escape enemies and to reproduce, not the ability to do mathematics. It is just the intelligence needed for survival, just that the intelligence needed for survival can also be used to construct mathematical proofs. He was commenting some years ago on Roger Penrose's fascinating physics and metaphysics of everything, including the human mind. Everything includes what Penrose calls the platonic world, which Hawking had no use for. In terms of current academic philosophy of mathematics, Penrose would be filed as a Platonist, Hawking as a naturalist. But that, of course, is not what is interesting about their philosophies. Tantalizing as it would be to pursue the fascinating disagreements between two of the most creative, speculative senior cosmologists of the day, my use of Hawking's casual remark will be pedestrian. It serves as a nice coat peg on which to hang several thoughts. At first reading, his observation sounds just right for its length, and it invites a more cautious second reading. One thing that's right is that the capacity for proving 
is very much a byproduct of human evolution by natural selection. It had no survival value in the early days of our species. Whatever nexus of Darwinian adaptations culminated in us, the capacity for proof construction was not selected for its survival value. Maybe the opposite. If you've ever watched somebody trying to prove something, <laughs> uh, they're not going to do well against the average carnivore. <laughs> this suggests that human capacities rely on a general processor. There might nevertheless be highly specialized cognitive modules acquired in the case of human or primate evolution that are preconditions for the exercise of this capacity. Hawking ventured, as I am doing, on amateur biology. In essence, he observed that whatever ensured human survival cannot have selected mathematical ability. A capacity for what we now call mathematics, and I don't think that's obvious what mathematics is, a capacity for what we now call mathematics is a byproduct of a path pursued to survive to our present state. But there has to be more to the story than that. It's a long way from evading predators and reproducing to constructing demonstrative proofs. So how did mathematics become possible? And let's not discount earthworms, which uh, Hawking dismisses, but were actually one of the primary fascinations of Charles Darwin. He spent an enormous amount of time studying earthworms. In a, and actually, I had an uncle who established, whose name was McDougal, which is my middle name, who had a farm in British Columbia, and he established a company long before its time called McDougal Earthworms. And you could buy earthworms to improve your dirt. Of course, he went broke. But nowadays, earthworms are quite important for, and you can make a living selling earthworms. One developmental psychologist is quoted as saying recently, what's interesting and surprising in our results is that the same system we spend years trying to acquire in school and that we use to send a man to the moon and that has inspired the likes of Plato, Einstein and Stephen Hawking, I quote, has something in common with what a rat is doing when it is out hunting for food. Now, a point of pedantry. It's uninterestingly obvious that when it comes to evolution, all is not well with Hawking's off-the-cuff observations. The point of being pedantic here is only to guard against a certain unreflective, just-so storytelling that is appealing but can be misleading. A moment's reflection stops one short of the assertion that, to quote, the intelligence needed for survival can be used to construct mathematical proofs. Every species that persists survives. And so it has the intelligence needed for its survival. Earthworms, Hawking's own example, do quite well, early birds notwithstanding. Rats, just compared to Hawking among Einstein and Plato and other wordies, have a better probability of surviving in the future than people do. Yet only we construct proofs. So someone might say, yes, but the intelligence that humans need for survival enable them to construct proofs as well as to survive. The thought would go something like this. What we mean by human is a species that can talk. And the intelligence needed for speech enables the construction of proofs. Now, there is a case to be made for the second. But we are making a remark about survival. There is no good reason to think that humans need speech to survive, unless tautologically, a human is defined 
as a talkative creature. But doesn't speech confer immense powers upon us, the very powers that enabled us to take over the planet? Yes, but if survival is what's in question, creatures much like us survive very well without speech in the very 100,000 years or so in which speech was evolving. The just-so instinct conjures up a picture of speech enabling us to coordinate our defenses against those omnipresent predators, which is what evolutionary psychology likes a lot of, predators getting you. There's actually a wonderful uh, essay by Marshall Solins, the anthropologist, who says that maybe there was a Garden of Eden. In Paleolithic times, life was never better for the human race. Nobody bothered us. We, that's how, why we were able to evolve. In other words, we were already so much smarter than the predators, which are so popular to evolutionary psychology. Anyway, whether that's the right way to go or wrong to go, primates, just like us, survived just fine without speech. Intelligence required for survival is not enough for mathematics. Well, that's enough pedantry. How did mathematics become possible? How on earth? Kant asked, how is pure mathematics possible? By which he actually meant, how is applied mathematics possible? <laughs> no, that's only because the concept of applied mathematics came in after Kant and partly thanks to Kant. Uh, Newton didn't think of himself as an applied mathematician or a pure mathematician. There was no such concept, but that's a long story. Kant's question led to a philosophy that changed the intellectual life of Europeans forever. Kant really did change how the Western world thought of itself. But I'm asking a much simpler question, much less important. How did mathematics become possible? That is, how did a species come into being that could engage with such eclat in mathematics, both for its own sake, what we now call pure, and also as a way to investigate all things large and small, and to change the face of the planet forever. The question divides into many inquiries which are still in Kuwait, ill thought out. Some have to do with human capacities and some with human history. So I want to direct your attention to five vague questions. First, what are the specific capacities of human beings that enable most people to grasp the rudiments of shapes and numbers? What are the capacities, which may be the same ones, that enable some people to do more adventuresome mathematics? The cognitive, scientist, the cognitive scientist asks a subsidiary question. Which of these questions and capacities are run by a simple general processor and which result from specific and distinct mental modules. Second, a prehistorical question. How on earth, I mean on earth, did some people long ago start on the various practices that we can, in retrospect, recognize as mathematical? I emphasize earth because this will be an interaction between human beings and their environment, which makes it ultimately an ecological question. Those little stones up there are not there accidentally. Third, questions about how, in various localities, in different parts of the world, at different times, proto-mathematical practices developed into what is recognizably mathematical. That's history. 
Fourth, what makes mathematics mathematics? Previous questions take for granted that we know already. Is there a single core, a sort of essence, that constitutes mathematics? Or is there no more than a name and a group of evolving practices that in retrospect we can weave into a more or less coherent line from early days until now. One iconoclastic contemporary mathematician says, you know, what we call mathematics is just the result of a random walk. And it would be totally different if the random walk had been different. Fifth, is it continuity or rupture that we're looking at? Implicit in this chain of questions is the picture of accumulation of potentials, beginning perhaps with the ability to tell at a glance whether one group of things is larger than another, and ending with today's Fields medalists every four years, the top prizes in mathematics. The continuity picture takes for granted a jump from possibly innate capacities to social inventions or discoveries at specific moments of history. But it assumes a picture of various points on a graph of development, which can be joined in a smooth ascending line. Even the random walk analogy implicitly favors accumulation upwards. But maybe that's too complacent. Not a random hill walk, but something more chaotic. We, nobody today, everybody today or whatever, do not have answers to any of these vague questions. An enormous amount has been found out in the past quarter century. Even so, we have no more than what I call islands of knowledge in a sea of ignorance. Islands because they are located in many different disciplines, which seldom interact. Neurobiology, archaeology, developmental psychology, prehistory, cognitive sciences, linguistics, sociology, and good old-fashioned history. Now, I don't aim at building bridges between them. We, I want only in this talk to catch a glimpse of what many disciplines are doing right now. I call these islands of cognitive history, adopting a phrase from the subtitle of a book about ancient Greek mathematics by Reveal Nets, published a decade ago. The Shaping of Deduction, a Study in Cognitive History. Now, what is cognitive history? In an email a year ago, Reveal Nets offered this. A proper cognitive history refers explicitly to the biologically cognitive facts out of which the particular bit of history is made and provides an account for how such skills got to play out and be transformed through history. Cognitive history, in turn, falls under ecological history, for which Netz's model is the work of Alfred Crosby in a book called, a book published uh, 25 years ago, Ecological Imperialism, the Biological Expansion of Europe, 900, 1900. Actually, it's a Think about that, the biological expansion of Europe, 900 and 1900. We are part, we here in this room are part of the biological expansion of Europe. Although there are, of course, some people in this room who are not at all from Europe at all, but they're all part of that biological expansion, whether they come from India or Africa or China. Nets continued, well done ecological history pays real attention to the biological facts of species and ecosystems 
and then provides an account of how these got to play out and be transformed by history. That's the kind of form of answer to my question, how did mathematics become possible? But it's not too unkind to say that cognitive history is a wish and a prayer. A year ago, a student of mine wrote Nets, asking what he meant by cognitive history. And Nets replied with a parable, in part. Nets said, I am told that Mahatma Gandhi asked for his view of Western civilization, replied, that would be a good idea. <laughs> Nets continued, I believe that's what Ian and I think of cognitive history. Exactly, it would be a good idea. We may nevertheless imagine a happy upshot. Cognitive history would start with human biology, the human body, including hand and brain. It is a body in an environment, which includes other people. It has probably mattered to arithmetic, for example, that we have an opposable thumb for picking up small objects like those to use as counters. For all our emphasis on mathematical genius and talk of the brain, Hawking talked about the brain, it is evident from a visit to any mathematics tea room that social arrangements among people and interactions among them are more than the cement of mathematics. They are collectively not its mind stuff but it's mind and body stuff. There's a lot of gesticulating to convey ideas, and usually a whiteboard for drawing diagrams. You might protest that it's the brain alone that counts toward cognitive history. We could instance none other than Stephen Hawking. By the nature of his illness, he can no longer gesticulate. He does not draw diagrams, even though many cosmologists of his ilk think with diagrams of infinite space and time that were pioneered, in fact, by Roger Penrose. Hawking has the right to speak, as in his remark that I quoted, of the evolution from earthworm brains to human brains, brains to the exclusion of all else. He is, I believe, the exception that proves the rule. It's of great independent interest to find out how a man trapped in a brain can think. Happily, a young French sociologist has spent two years talking with Hawking and his associates, and I will give a mention of how it is that Stephen Hawking actually thinks in his brain. He relies a lot on material things. So we have to turn to every aspect of the mathematical animal. Given the quarries I've just sketched, the cognitive sciences and the history of civilizations are called for. We're concerned with hands and brains and practices, ideas, communities, genius, technology, among much else. I will mention epigenetics and archeology. span even history, so much better trodden, is all too much. Mathematics is all too much. And a further type of question which might be filed under sociology or science studies. The discovery of a capacity needs uptake in a community. What social relationships make that possible from case to case? What practices and institutions emerged in order for the activity to continue? Well, it's all too much, certainly for one talk and maybe for a lifetime. I've mentioned these fairly disparate fields, from archaeology to mathematics to sociology to brain imaging to child developmental psychology to ecology. To repeat the metaphor, I see these as islands in a sea of ignorance. Talk of islands invites the cliché of building bridges. I have no interest in that. I am sometimes described as an interdisciplinary bridge builder. I am no such thing. In print, I call myself a complacent disciplinarian. I would like to be a disciplined drainage engineer, but I lack all the skills. 
Think of Holland. Think of the 17th century Dutch engineers who drained the fens around Cambridge, England, so that the Isle of Ely, as it was called, on which a giant cathedral now stands, became a st stable part of England. We don't want to build bridges, but to lower the sea level of ignorance so we can see how these unconnected inquiries connect. Starting in the 1980s, there was an immense growth of knowledge about core capacities, such as the ability to tell that there are just three people right there, or that there's a whole lot more people in this room than were here when I first came. So there's what's called supertizing, and the ability to tell two fairly large sets of fairly different sizes, which one is bigger, not by counting, but just by looking. And everyone was astonished to find that infants, practically newborn infants, appear to be able to do something like this. Well, how on earth can one tell with a newborn infant? Because infants get bored quickly. They focus on changes, but not on things that say the same. Put three objects in front of a baby, and it tires of them. It's also bored if the three are taken away and replaced by three all over again. But replace three by two, or by four, the infant is fascinated. And the same happens not only with things, but with sounds. It's as if children can even have the beginnings of this, glim glimmerings of this stuff. Moving from developmental psychology to ethnography, the same is true of all peoples. So it appears. These capacities are human universals. And many animals have limited abilities of this sort. These phenomena are the beginning of what my colleague Stanislas de Haine calls the number sense. He wrote an excellent semi-popular book, that title a decade or more ago. And at the same time, Brian Butterworth in England published a parallel study of results, which were called in Britain the mathematical brain, but modishly retitled in the USA as what counts, how every brain is hardwired for math. Be very cautious of that idea of every brain being hardwired for math. It's not Butterworth's title. And most of us actually aren't hardwired for good math. Most of us are bad mathematicians. Both these two men are leading researchers in the field, though I should say that much of the research has been led by women such as Rochelle Gelman, Elizabeth Spelke, and Susan Carey. Brain imaging enables researchers to discover where in the brain the action is, when one supertizes or does other elementary work with numerosity. Now, counting is not a completely universal phenomenon. There really are people who count only one too many. But they can very quickly learn to count. I shall, you know, sometime tonight, turn to pre-conquest Inca. Quechua is a family of Andean dialects still widely spoken. It's believed the dialect around Cusco in Peru very much resembles what was spoken before the Spanish arrived. They manipulated, they, the Inca, manipulated numbers brilliantly. But for example, only women could count produce, flocks, and children. And the verb to multiply in many languages starts with procreation, as Genesis advises, be fruitful and multiply. So even in, among many peoples, numbering, counting, is specific to particular concepts. Those of you who are philosophers know that Frege said counting applies to concepts. He may be, have been the first person to insist that, that, con that numbers reply to concepts, not to things. But in fact, most not very numerically developed peoples 
take for granted that the numbers of your children are different from the numbers of your sheep. Let us suppose, however, there is a universal human number module and an innate facility for comparing numerosity without counting of manageable groups. I think that the research in this field has reached a sort of plateau, which I call the cognitive plateau. Suppose we take the state of affairs in a 2010 survey paper by Dehane, whom I mentioned already, who asserts that we have a brain system located somewhere which extracts numerosity of sets and maps back to numerical symbols corresponding quantities. The system is available to animal species and to preverbal human infants. Its neural organization is increasingly being uncovered, leading to a precise mathematical theory of how we perform tasks of number comparison or number naming. The next challenge <clears throat> will be to understand how education changes our core intuitions of numbers. In other words, we've got to a plateau where we're really talking rats and maybe earthworms and babies. And now we have to understand what happens to education. Parallel, <coughs> parallel to the work on number, a lot of new developments in the study of spatial reasoning. But the situation there is seminal, similar to the one described by Dehane. Elizabeth Spelke and a couple of her colleagues have just published a paper called Beyond Core Knowledge, Natural Geometry. And they write that like natural number, natural geometry is founded at least on at least two evolutionary ancient, early developing, cross-developing, cross-culturally universal cognitive systems that capture abstract information about the shape of the surrounding world. Two systems of geometry. But each system is limited. Children go beyond these limits and construct a new system of geometric representation that is more complete and general by combining productively the representations. Thus, like the system of number, the system of geometry that fool, feels most natural to educated adults is a hard-won cognitive achievement constructed by children as they engage with, call it culture. In both these statements, made by two leading figures in the field, we have the picture of a core system, part of the human heritage and maybe also to some extent rats, followed by a massive cultural superstructure. I'm going to take that as a working, revel a working assumption. So what happened? What, did we, what, what were the historical events that matter most to our becoming, making that cultural leap? I'll give one example, if I can find it. Why isn't it here? I'll give one example which is connected with these, with the pictures I had on the board. Small baked clay objects, called tokens or counters, are found throughout Mesopotamia and more generally throughout the European Near East or West Asia, correctly speaking, beginning about 8,000 BC. These are the oldest fashioned objects fired into ceramics, which are to be found in that cradle of civilization. These are the oldest fired objects. The system of tokens, this is the work of Schmant Bessera, started with a basic repertory of plain tokens, that's those, in geometric and naturalistic shapes that remained in use 
during the first 5,000 years of its existence. They were mostly, she says, geometric shapes, such as cones, spheres, flat and lenticular disks, cylinders and tetrahedrons, and only occasionally ovoids, rectangles, triangles, biconoids, and hyperboloids. The naturalistic shapes, such as vessels and animals, are also limited. Markings remain rare. Plain tokens usually had a smooth face. Now, this, I'm interested in these as tokens. In this talk, I will only have the ability to say something about numbers. But notice these tokens. These are the first in the cradle of our civilization, Mesopotamia, objects that were fired and preserved as ceramics. And what are they? They're all, this fascinates me. Shemant Besserat doesn't even mention it, but it fascinates me. They're all the shapes of elementary geometrical objects. Why is it that people wanted, thought when they would make a, two counters different, they'd make one a sphere and one a tetrahedron, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It's as if we're preordained to do a certain kind of geometry. Whether that's because of our enthusiasm for symmetry or whatever, it's a curious fact that these kinds of shapes are the first ones we did. Later on, we did other shapes, more complicated. We made marks on them. And here's a bevy of various kinds of shapes. But I'm talking now 5,000 years of, of, de of human development. She's not interested in the shapes and their symmetries, but in their use. A remarkable fact is that many of these tokens are found in clay envelopes. That's a funny expression there. But they're, they're round balls containing these things, which as time goes on have more and more marking upon them. These lead her to an astounding conjecture about the origins of cuneiform writing. And here is a philosopher's sketch, not an archaeologist's sketch of her account. First, there was counting and tallies of objects counted. The objects might have been items of trade or commerce. In Mesopotamia, 7000 BC, there was a sophisticated organization and hierarchical social structures, master and servants, slaves, etc. Uh, she herself quotes Levi Strauss asserting that wherever writing emerged, hierarchy was there before it. A merchant takes three or seven urns of pressed oil. A tally of the transaction is recorded by a numeral, three or seven strokes, scratched in clay. Or maybe a bundle of three or seven tokens, the, the simple ones, not the fancy ones. But tokens are more versatile than strokes. strokes. A cylinder might represent one type of object, an urn of oil, a tetrahedron, an urn of wine, a disc, a fleece. Seven fleece are represented by seven discs, three urns of oil by three cylinders. And she proposes that the early stages of cuneiform writing started with five. It's we who are counters. But to, we, to be counters, we need count, we needed counters, things like this. Counter means many things. It means a surface. That's important. A counter in your kitchen is a surface. But it also means people who count. It means we who count. It also means the things we use for counting. The word counter is the memory in language of how we became arithmeticians. It's not only memory in language. There's the calculus the differential and integral calculus. The old medical word for gallstone was also calculus, which puzzled me a long time when I was interested in the history of medicine. The same word as differential and integral calculus? Because both words come from the Latin for pebble. 
That is, the original counters in the Roman world and the Greek world were pebbles, not these interesting shapes. We, the counters, counted with counters, namely pebbles. So did everyone else who moved from innate endowments to a use of arithmetic, which is profoundly cross-cultural, but not in the brain. It's sort of in the hand. We have thumb and forefinger. We can pick up whatever we choose that is small. Pebbles, in much of the world, cowrie shells, in Mesoamerica, seeds, and then we begin to compute. Arithmetic is embodied, but mostly in a small part of the hand and the arm that can move it. And of course, the brain. But we have to look at what we have done with hands. Arithmetic, I propose, begins with little movable objects and our ability to move them about, combined with our innate sense of numerosity. There is something that many people have figured out how to do. <clears throat> One anthropologist describes the arithmetic prowess of cowrie shells users in northern Nigeria. And then there are the Upana, which I shall mention in a moment, the most efficient and profound abacus devised by the people of the Indies. Now, as you may have noticed, most of what I want to say is now down here. So I shall pick it up, I think. Sorry about this. Let's see, I'm really... It's already 9 o'clock, and we're supposed to go and have pastries at 9 o'clock. Um, let me just emphasize a few things. Um, first, that while cognitive capacities remain the same, access to different skills can produce remarkable results. Uh, Jack Goody, the anthropologist, proposed that the acquisitions of means of communication, such as writing and the making of lists or tables to store or transmit information, should be seen as effectively transforming the nature of cognitive processes in a manner that the partial dissolution of the boundaries affected by psychologists and linguists between abilities and performance. Now, so what we've got is a remarkable change from the world of counting to something more. Here is uh, a kipu, an Inca method of recording numbers, using knots in ropes, ropes according to a positional system. We don't, nobody has quite figured out how the kipu works. The Inca had no writing but they had a system of keeping numerical records using strings with knots and colors, these kipu, which is a beautiful ecological example because the material resources to them include a particular kind of wool with unusually long strands from the yama and an advanced textile technology, including colorfast dyes. In the field, of practical three-dimensional geometry, they had a skill found, so far as I know, nowhere else in the world for creating precisely interlocking boulders of enormous size, each one different from the other, but fitting each other exactly. These are non-convex polyhedra, and they're earthquake-proof, which is how they set their own standard for flexible rigidity, a very interesting concept in, ma in applied mathematics. The high Mesopotamian civilizations furnish remarkable controlled experiments for technology, having evolved independently 
of Eurasian ones. So we've got the stuff happening in Peru and Mexico and so on, and the stuff happening in Mesopotamia. There's no contact between those. There's lots of contact between Mesopotamia and China. Eurasia is all one, despite what we're sometimes told. But one thing that's totally different is we've got these people in our hemisphere and those people in their hemisphere, and they do exactly the same thing. Not just in numbers. I mean, the way the Inca Empire was run, about the size of the Roman Empire, despite the fact that they didn't have wheels and they didn't have writing, is almost exactly the same as the way in which the Roman Empire was run. As if they're kind of human universals here. But I just uh, uh, speak of the numbers. So here we have various kinds of prostheses. We have to wonder how the passage from paper and pen to electronic technology will affect not just our mathematical practice, but our very thought processes. Uh, one anthropologist has a wonderful phrase, technology of the intellect. What's now called experimental mathematics, pure mathematics usually done by exploration on a computer, has had a far greater impact on mathematics than is usually recognized. Though thus far there's only one journal, experimental mathematics, dedicated to the field. We might guess that every mathematical prosthesis, starting with paper, stylus, and going on through state edge and compass to modern computer programs, not only enhances our skills, but modifies our minds. This is a field which has now become known as the archaeology of mind. Look at the artifacts which we have made and consider how they have changed not just our cultural skills, but possibly the way our brains are. We hear lots of popular talk about that when we're wondering you know, how iPads change the minds of our children. But this has been going on forever. As we've developed new artifacts, we changed the ways in which we think and talk, but probably also changed our minds. How much that is possible, we don't know. I mean, we know, for instance, that, say, the brain of a London taxi driver is very different from most people's brains. It has a, the bit which is devoted to the spatial organization is vastly larger than in your or my brain. One might think epigenetically that if taxi drivers bred taxi drivers, which in fact they have in London for 100 years, that's a clothes shop, uh, that, uh, in fact, that just kind of affects the children after a while, and they all start to be like that. That's what epigenetics is all about. Uh, I have to scurry, I realize. Uh, this is an example of something different from the kipu, and which we've only just figured out, probably. For a long time, in museums, these objects called a yupana, which just means counter, means abacus, were regarded in the most bizarre ways by Europeans. For instance, it was often said, this is a model of a fortress. Well, you can see why if you're a European. Unfortunately, Inca never built a fortress remotely like this ever, so it can't exactly be a model of a fortress. What it is, it's a, it's a wonderful abacus. And uh, it has even been argued that the way in which you move the seeds from one square to another actually relies on a very quick computing device which involves the Fibonacci numbers. I, I, what I've been emphasizing throughout, obviously, is embodiment. That the beginning of mathematics is not in the brain. Well, it's in the brain, but it's in the embodied brain. It's in the brain that can move things around. And it's also in the body, if we turn to geometry, which can draw diagrams. It is that which enable, if we didn't have the ability to move our hands and draw shapes in sand or on clay or whatever, we wouldn't have geometry. Uh, when a few years ago, I became interested in a particular branch of experimental physics, Bose-Einstein condensation, and I visited a number of very important labs around the world 
talking to, to my hosts, who are extraordinarily generous, spend three days talking to the director down to the undergraduates who worked there, or up to the director, or whatever it was. And uh, what struck me, I'll take two examples, one in Innsbruck, one in Colorado. In Innsbruck, they had whiteboards, and in Colorado, they had blackboards. But in both cases, there were chalk or felt markers to, to hand. And as I was walking down, somebody was explaining something to me, and they'd stop and start drawing a diagram. But it was not the kind of stale, pale diagram you see in a stationary uh, PowerPoint or in a book. It was they were explaining how their mind worked by drawing. I could see each step in the motion of the mind, in the motion of the body as the shapes came out on the white or blackboard. And it came clear to me that, in fact, the way in which we communicate many mathematical ideas post movement of these counters is through. Excuse me, the. Uh... Hmm? Oh, I should get rid of something here. Uh, uh, what's this to do? Get rid of it. This is not my machine, so it's not my battery. <coughs> <laughs> Although, I think your batteries are running out. It's 10 past 9. So let me just draw attention uh, to uh, one other aspect of mathematics, the regular polyhedra. Um, the only trouble is that uh, when you look at them like that, they don't have these nice marks on them. Uh, they have, uh, they don't look like that. They look like whatever comes next. Uh, uh, somebody's drawn these things, and it turns out that these balls uh, are, it just happens that in Oxford, in the Ashmolean Museum, where Michael Atiyah was wandering around, they have these five balls, and he said, my God, they've got the five, the five platonic solids. But in fact, archaeologists have got about 25 different kinds of solids, most of which are not platonic. He's wrong. But there's something very important in what he's saying. All of these objects, and the, not just these, but the ones which are not in the Ashmolean Museum, all have remarkable symmetries. And that is the other aspect of the human mind that we recognize symmetries, and those are the basis of what we now take to be the most important parts of mathematics. The one thing I want to leave you with, we've, I've now emphasized what is totally prehistoric, this is 2,000 years before Plato, is, why, why don't I, I was doomed. Uh, oh, I just want to put up one final, Okay, why isn't it? I want to put up one um, final remark by Dirac, because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. There's something really strange, which is why on earth should these primitive capacities have anything to do with the universe? Indeed, that's sort of what uh, Hawking said. You know, we have no explanation of He left out all the story I've told you tonight. But we have no explanation of why that's so great. And here is Dirac possibly saying that everything might be, everything about the universe might be represented in numbers. Or maybe the universe just is one big number. How on earth do we pass between these primitive things which make mathematics possible to the conjecture that everything is mathematical. That I believe to be the fundamental enigma of the philosophy of mathematics. I believe it's extremely important to try to come to grips with phenomena of which I've given you a few examples tonight, but that the real philosophical step is to figure out how, what is the connection between all these skills which come out with relatively early 
human beings, although not all that early. We're really talking only seven or 8,000 years ago, which is nothing, even in, the <coughs> even in the history of the human race. But somehow between there and here, something else happened, which I, which I myself think is the discovery of proofs. Kant thought so, too. One, an extraordinary passage in the, in the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, where he talks about, he's the first person ever to talk about revolution in science, and he talks about the discovery of proofs as being a revolutionary event. He attributes it to people in Greece, maybe not exactly people in Greece, who cares now, we know a little more history, but somehow something happened there. And that is the next stage in the kind of investigation to which I have been directing you tonight, and which has, I see, gone on quite late enough. So thank you very much. But I, <clears throat> I will be talking about the quote from Dirac tomorrow, that it's all numbers. Yeah, you're, you're in charge of pointing to people. Uh, so I think we have some time for a few questions before we drink for refreshments outside. So if there are any interested uh, individuals, uh, it's over here. Hi, uh, Lauren King with Laurie University. I, uh, this may not be a especially deep point, but I wonder what you think of it. The one thing that strikes me when I, I see a lot of the attention to the archaeological evidence around weights and measures and the formation of standards and the, the visceral creation of these, these tokens, is in all the cases, in the Mesoamericas and in Mesopotamia, uh, and certainly in Egypt, these all correspond also with the rise of distinctively urban settlements with certain specific spatial forms. But each spatial form has very different you know, meanings and uses in each setting. For the Inca, these spatial forms, kind of you know, elaborate symmetry built there, viscerally experienced, are almost entirely ceremonial. Whereas in Mesopotamia, especially around those periods of consolidation of Ur, uh, they're far more closely linked to trade. People are really living in these messy, sort of you know, cacophonous spaces, but there's still a kind of overarching spatial order to it. And you've got to wonder when you think about how we encounter those sorts of spaces in our day-to-day -day lives, whether that would have something to do with the rise of this you know, kind of mindset for you know, sort of mapping these complex geometries in space. Uh, do you see the rise of the city as integral to the rise of the possibility of arithmetic? Um, that's a beautiful question. <clears throat> that's a beautiful question. And I completely agree. Uh, just to move it back uh, a little bit, um, in uh, one of my, uh, well, one of my colleagues in Paris, uh, jointly with a number of other people, uh, took a, uh, a, a people in the Amazon where there had been almost no contact and, est and established to the satisfaction of the group that these people had all the basic geometrical concepts. And I asked another colleague, Philippe Escola, who, who did his research work in the people of Levi Strauss, who did all his research work in Ecuador, what he thought about this. And he said, yeah, it's kind of obvious. I mean, look, these people live in a village. The village has everything laid out in a geometrical way. Of course they've got geometrical concepts. So it wasn't, uh, yes, when they had the city-state, they've got a little village about the size of the stage. But already that is laid out Everybody, every member of, so here's the, here is the anthropologist as opposed to the cognitive scientist speaking. Every, every person in the village, this is my place, in my hut. And here is my wife's place, in this hut. So of course they've got geometrical things, so you're completely right. But it is also true, uh, the interesting uh, uh, claim connected with those, uh, those funny counters is that that's, where, that's how an urban society developed writing, where cuneiform came from. I didn't mention this, there's too much going on, but uh, her uh, Besara's idea is that, next step, uh, 
they put the counters for the deal, for the trade, cities, obviously, wine or fleece or whatever, in an envelope. And then they have to have, that's, that's the kind of permanent record, it's like what you give your advocate and put into a uh, safety deposit box. But then what's in the safety deposit box? So they write down some marks. And then somebody thinks, well, this is just Stowe's story, but it's very plausible. We don't have to do that. We can make a mark for seven. And, that, and then, moreover, we could make a mark for what we're talking about. And yo and behold, cuneiform writing stamped on these envelopes, all having to do with urbanization and trade. Of course, arithmetic turns from counters into numbers only when there is trade. And it doesn't have to be trade in our sort. Uh, Jack Goody uh, observing uh, the trade in northern Nigeria, where the main interest is in um, how much you get for your daughter in a bridal contract. And it turns out, and it's done in cowrie shells, which are already counters. And, it, and he found, because uh, he was there just at the point where the Brits had introduced schooling, so that some of the children there had had a rather good Scottish Missionary Society training in arithmetic. And other children there had none. When it came to doing any of the practical computations involving cowrie cells, the children who had no arithmetical skill training were much faster and more accurate than the children who had arithmetic. It was only later that they would get into this other way of thinking. So it's a very, as you say, it's a very complicated his history of ethnography story to be told here. Okay, wonderful. Um, there's the next question here. Uh, you've identified the importance of uh, the ability to count, which we pick up pebbles and, and we draw pictures. I wonder if you would also um, identify the importance of uh, our having developed consciousness of time, memory of the past, anticipation of the future in particular, um, awareness of the cyclical seasons. I'm not quite sure what the question is. I mean, could you pick up the question? Uh, perhaps you could rephrase. Well, um, One sentence. In addition to counting, it isn't the counting. Might uh, the, uh, the counting of the seasons, uh, celestial, which you know, led to celestial mechanics and uh, try to identify patterns of uh, when the seasons are about to begin? Yeah, look. Uh, there's something very, Im as if I guess the point of the question, I may be wrong, uh, there's something very important here. <clears throat> the, uh, there are a number, there's an awful lot of very interesting, very old work, um, which is not in the past 20 years, but in 100 years and more ago. One exactly 100 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> most everybody <clears throat> has vaguely heard of Köhler and Kafka uh, uh, as the um, founders of Gestalt psychology. Actually, the real founder of Gestalt psychology, and I owe this to a colleague at Queen's University, David Murray, who's written a book about it, uh, is that it's, there's a man called Max Wertheimer, and he got the whole idea of Gestalt psychology from thinking about how people are able to recognize numbers to what's now called supertizing. And he went through, he was writing in German, uh, he went through uh, all the German and to some extent British literature about people's recognition of numbers. And remember, uh, when you start learning any foreign language, about the second lesson, they start teaching you numbers. I know, I'm just starting to learn Spanish. Uh, and there it is, numbers. And I remember <coughs> that in my ancient uh, language learning classes when I was a child, I was taught numbers. When German and British um, anthropologists went out to live with other peoples, 
the first thing they tried to figure out was what their number system was, because it's kind of easy one. You can sort of, you know, you can do it, and the people respond. So there was an enormous amount of knowledge about uh, other people's use of numbers. <coughs> and one of, and what uh, Max, Ver Max, Max Wertheimer said, there's an ability to recognize shape of numbers and the gestalt of a number. And that led to the whole theory of gestalt psychology. So, <coughs> so there's this mix between the practice, the understanding of arithmetic, and the prior ability to recognize. One of the things which I think is important about the turn of the 20th century as opposed to the turn of the 21st century anthropological ethno ethnographic investigations is that a hundred years ago uh, they took for granted that there was nothing universal except that you could tell five fleece on one occasion and you could tell five jars of, or five jars of wine on another or you could tell five children and often you had different names for these different groups, but you could tell them all. But they all had a different gestalt. Whereas now, the cognitive scientists want to say, it's all universal. There's just five out there which people recognize. I think the older guys uh, were onto something which the newer universalism has forgotten. But that's a little bit off your question, but something that I hope is interesting. So perhaps in the interests of time, we'll take one more shorter question. I don't think you got a chance to talk about what makes mathematics mathematics, and I just wondered if proofs come into play there, or if you can say a couple words about that. A <laughs> uh, couple. <laughs> I I actually published. Look, just just to boast. Uh, why not boast? Uh, I published a paper called What Makes Mathematics Mathematics uh, in, uh, in 2010, which will appear in a volume called The Best Writing About Mathematics of 2010. So it, somebody else thought it was okay, too. Uh, the, I think that it's a very... I am much impressed with the remark that what makes mathematics mathematics is a random historical walk. If you actually look at what people have called mathematics from just in, the, just in the Western tradition, from Babylonia, Egypt, but of course notably in Greece, to now, the stories have been extraordinarily different. Um, and one can see how they get moved along. And it's not at all clear that the kind of answer we would give today would have been given by 300 years ago, let alone 1,800 years ago or 2,200 years ago or whatever. Um, I am inclined to think that what makes mathematics mathematics is a contingent random walk. Not my phrase, but it, it just, that's, that's what we now call mathematics. Uh, other people would respond totally differently and say that mathematics is the study of structures, which of course is true, but they're very different structures over the course of time. And the structures that we find important are very different from what people in the past have found important. Now, in a way, it's a, it's, it's a bit like the really ancient philosophical question of universals. Uh, people who believed in universals said there just is something there, whereas nominalists said there's just what we call so-and-so. And I think there's a, a kind of fundamental division. <coughs> I think it was Jung <coughs> who said that we're either born Platonists or Aristotelians. I was born an Aristotelian. Uh, but one can imagine someone who's born Platonist would say, of all the story I've told you tonight, it's just a gradual story of human beings gr finding out about the mathematical structures of, the math of mathematics. And the alternative story 
is it's all a contingent history of what goes on with all these little counters and so on, the upana, the abacuses, the counting devices. Uh, everything, there's nothing which is kind of given. Everything just evolves in time. Uh, I uh, take the nominalist view, which is not really, for me, incompatible with the realist view. Um, say, you know, express it your own way. But there's a very long story behind that answer, and what can I do but refer you to my profound printed answer? <laughs> So on that wonderful note, and before we make a transition to the reception outside, I'll just welcome to the stage Professor George Freeman, the president of the Faculty Association, to thank this evening's speaker. So it's a, it's a tough job. You've given me so much to think about that I would probably be able to adequately thank you sometime next week, maybe. So I'm, I'm back at the beginning of the talk, still thinking about the survival value of proofs. <laughs> I, I somehow have been in this environment for maybe over three decades where there's a very high survival value for proofs. <laughs> so maybe that says something. And it's kind of coincidental. I just happened to be reading a book that relates to your last slide where somebody was positing the question of something like, what is it about the universe that causes what is it about the physics of the universe that causes one of its outputs to be people producing proofs? <laughs> so it's kind of a curious, I, you know, I'll be a long time processing what you've talked about. And I'm also taking home the notion of uh, not building bridges. They're very fragile and uh, thin. And I, I like this notion of draining away the, the, uh, the sea of unknowledge, or whatever, I forget what you call it exactly, but the sea of uncertainty between the disciplines. Sea of ignorance. That's <laughs> good. Thank you. <laughs> you can tell how slowly my brain works. <laughs> so anyways, I'd like to thank you uh, very much on behalf of uh, the association and the university for giving us such a, a great talk tonight. Thank you. <laughs>